Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College Online Journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. Make sure not to miss a single podcast and subscribe to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast at iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite subscription service. The views expressed in this presentation are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of the U.S. Army War College, U.S. Army, or Department of Defense. Welcome to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast. I'm Michael Nyberg, Chair of War Studies at the U.S. Army War College, and I'm here today with Stephen Platt, historian of modern China at UMass Amherst and author of, among other books, Imperial Twilight, The Opium War and the End of China's Last Golden Age, and Autumn in the Heavenly Kingdom, China, the West, and the Epic Story of the Taiping Civil War, which won the prestigious Kundo Prize uh, for History. Welcome, Stephen, and thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Michael. It's nice to be here. I, I want to start by asking you where you first developed an interest in China, and when in your life did you think, I, I really want to write history about this place? Oh, good question. Um, my first introduction to China actually came at the end of college. I went through high school and college knowing absolutely nothing about about China whatsoever. Um, when I was a senior, I got a little pamphlet in my mailbox for a program to teach English in China. And it seemed like pretty much about the most exciting thing I could think of to do after graduating, you know, head off to a part of the world that I'd never been to, learn the language, you know, live there. So I spent two years living in Hunan province in central China and came back from that fairly sh- so this was mid 90s I, w- I was there from 93 to 95 um things were changing incredibly rapidly in china um it was also a time when yeah, when it seemed like americans just generally did not understand china whatsoever so i came back from that wanting to do something having to do with china and, two questions for you off of yeah. that so uh, uh, th- so if that pamphlet hadn't shown up in your mailbox do you think you would be doing, would you be sitting where you are right now? No. I mean, I might be sitting here talking about, talking about like Africa or India or something like that. Um, yeah. Actually, I mean, at, at my interview for, for the program, it was, it was the Yale China teaching program. Um, and at my interview for it, they said, well, if you showed up here and actually the sign on the door said Yale and India and you had misread, would you still want to do this program? I was like, heck yeah. You know, <laughs> like, yeah, it was, I mean. It was really a whim um, and wanting to go to a part of the world that I didn't know anything about, which at that point was probably most of the world. (laughs) So we we actually have two things in common. I have a friend who did the Yale and China program in Wuhan, and uh, I have a daughter uh, adopted from Changsha in in Hunan province. Changsha, that's that's. That's where I lived for two years. Yeah, what a coincidence. We we were in the same city, although at different at different points in time. Yeah, Um, yeah, and. um, and, and just uh, another funny coincidence with Changsha is when I when I went off there, it turned out that I had a great uncle who had gone to teach in Changsha in 1915, um, and his son sent me all of his letters just as I was leaving for China. And you so, didn't know about this? You knew nothing. I didn't about know. This. I didn't know any. I didn't know. I didn't know anything really about it. I think my dad had said, oh, "I think maybe Uncle Bob did something like that." Um, but yeah, I got this whole batch of letters, and I mean, I gotta say, like, I mean, I had never been interested in history prior to that. I was in, I was a math major who became an English major in college. Um, you know, I didn't take any history, but I think like the first time I had a sense of the resonances of history was sort of reading my great uncle's letters from 1915, you know, in the same town, teaching at the same institution where I was teaching in 1993, and just feeling the similarities and differences between those. I think that was probably the first time in my life that I really began to feel how like history can add depth to your understanding or your experience of the present. Well, that's a great story and a great way to start. So you had this incredible experience of uh, a sort of showing up in China, almost from a, a blank slate, finding out you had a relative who was who had done this. So you're you're sort of learning about China. I guess it's not too much to say, sort of as it as China was becoming more important to the United States and more important to the kind of political discourse here. So were you aware of that as you were beginning this process that you were taking an interest in something that was going to be very important? Or was that something that happened almost accidentally for you? No, it was definitely something that I felt at the time. I mean, just the incredible disjuncture between what I had expected it would be like in China and what it was actually like. Because, you know, figure 1993, four years after Tiananmen, 
as an American, I assumed that every Chinese person I met was going to be talking about overthrowing the government and how much they hate the Communist Party. And, whatnot. and I found pretty much the opposite. Um, that you know, people were very excited about the direction the country was going. People were generally very supportive of the party. Um, even people who I met who had taken part in demonstrations um, basically just told me, well, we learned in 1989 that politics is a dead end. And there were just so many new opportunities for people in their lives to start businesses, to start making money, to live in different places, um, to have much better lives than their parents had or that they had had previously. All of that was unexpected to me. And I think like it's those sorts of things where yeah, I, I came as, a, I think, a fairly typical American coming to China in 93. And the country was so different from what I had expected that it, you know, it made me want to go back and tell people about it and try to explain it to people back home. Um, I, I had a similar was experience. Impulse. I was there seven years or so after you were, and I was I was chasing a toddler around and, and learning how to be a parent. I wasn't doing what you were doing, but <laughs> I had that exact same impression that this is a very different place than what I thought it was, and certainly what I led American culture to make me think that it was. Uh, even just in the couple of weeks that we were there, and we went back again a couple of years later uh, and had the had the same experience this time to northern China. So as you were becoming an academic and becoming an historian of this period and going back for formal training, how did the way that China was evolving in real time affect the way that you thought about its history? Oh, that's a good question. Because um, historians, like, you know, I mean, you're a historian. We, we, we sometimes like to pretend that what we are doing is not related to the present, that we are yeah. sort of interested yeah. in sort of like universal <laughs> issues of the past. But obviously, everything is like things become interesting because they resonate somehow with the present. Um, and I think the. My, I mean, my first book, and this was true of the Taiping book, and to an extent it was true of the Opium War book as well, was sort of breaking through this myth that Westerners had about China, that it was sort of a closed system unto itself, um, and that it was like separate from the rest of the world, that it had developed separately. And I think the, the feeling of how engaged China was becoming in the world in the 90s and then the 2000s when I was in graduate school and going forward from that... Um, made me want to look back and find instances of this in the past um, and finding that going back, you know, a very long way indeed, there's been a, like a, this movement of ideas and people and commercial products. And, you know, that, that globalization began for China a long time ago. It isn't just some product of the 20th century. Yeah, um, you're, and you're, similarly, you're... like Chinese history is not just about China. It's about the foreigners who were coming and going as well. Yeah, this is a point you make pretty clearly in the Taiping Rebellion book, and and it, it is a kind of trope that the West has of China that it's sort of sitting there isolated until we discover it and and kind of shape it into something that we want it to be. And your your work has been uh, very upfront. You, you are very upfront in the introduction of the Taiping book and saying this this is simply not the case. China has always been a global actor. It's always been at the center of at least one of the world's major trade systems, if if not more than one. So again, do, do you think this is something that came as a part of your lived experience in China? Or do you think this is something that, that I don't know, maybe even unconsciously came as a, as a, as a function of your time there? I think unconsciously as a function of my time there. Um, it was also a way of sort of trying to puzzle to, you know, the differences between how China was written about from the outside by foreigners and how it was understood from the inside by people in China themselves. So with the Taiping Rebellion, which was, you know, it was the bloodiest civil war in human history and estimates range up to about 70 you know, million people died in the course of this. Um, I started working on it initially. I thought of doing a book on it initially because I had a student at UMass um, and I was teaching about the typing and he sort of raised this question. He said, well, if all these people died, but the same government just continued on in power, why did it matter? Um, and it was sort of finding out like, well, what did change? The Qing dynasty stayed in power. You know, they, they had started it in power and they ended it in power. Um, but in looking at it, trying to reconcile how people in China understood the war, which is that there was this one general on the imperial side, Zeng Guofan, who in the eyes of the Chinese basically single-handedly won the civil war um, by suppressing the rebels. Whereas if you look at foreign histories of it, a lot of them emphasize you know, foreign officers like this British guy, Charles Gordon, they used to call him Charles Chinese Gordon. He used to be up in the imperial pantheon with Lawrence of Arabia. Um, but the British believed that he had single-handedly reorganized China's armies and won the Civil War. 
Um, so the typing book was a way of bringing those together. Uh, maybe we should back up, and I'm going to ask you probably the hardest question that I can ask you, which is to summarize the Taiping Rebellion for listeners who don't know what it is. So the first thing we should do is probably put it in in, in space. It's happening at about the same time as the American Civil War and about yeah. the same time as the unifications of Germany and Italy. Uh, again, I know how hard this is when you've written a book about something as, as massive as the Taiping Rebellion, but give us two sentences to explain to listeners what this event is. So the Taiping Rebellion was a massive uprising against the Qing dynasty, which had been in power since 1644. Um, so the uprising began in the 1850s, nearly ended the dynasty. Um, and it was an uprising. On the one hand, it was led by a Christian fanatic who um, believed that he was the Chinese son of God who had been sent to China to build a Christian kingdom. But on a more meaningful level, it was an ethnic Chinese uprising um, against a dynasty that was ruled by Manchus who were, who were ethnically different from the Han Chinese. So I mean, as understood at the time, it was an ethnic uprising of sort of the Chinese people against the Manchus who had, who had ruled China since the 1600s. And again, the first thing that I do when I, if, in, when, I, when I teach this is sort of explain the American Civil War and the impact that it's had on the United States. And then, as you said, we're looking at tens of millions of people killed on the Chinese side, some of them from the war, some from famine, some from you know, other, other causes and the impact that it's had. Do, is, is this something that, is, that, that weighs heavily in Chinese memory? Do they think about the Taiping Rebellion in the way that we are still kind of obsessed by the Civil War? Or has this been sort of airbrushed by, by later years of, of communist government and historiography? Oh, it's, I mean, right now it's absolutely airbrushed. Um, back in the 19, like, like back in the early days of the People's Republic of China in the 1950s and 60s, um, Mao Zedong and the communists viewed the Taiping rebels as being sort of their, their predecessors. They saw them as like peasant rebels who tried to overthrow the, you know, the feudalistic overlord class, um, you know, but who failed only because they lacked the correct Marxist Leninist ideology that would have allowed them to succeed. So, so kids in China in the, you know, in the 60s, in the you know, 1950s and 60s up through the 70s learned that the Taiping rebels were the great heroes of that era. Um, who tried to overthrow the Qing. Then you get to a point in the 80s where you have a communist party in China that is no longer revolutionary in any way and does not want to encourage any more revolutionaries. So they turn it on its head. Um, so, I mean, up, like today, the Taiping are basically viewed as religious fanatics, foreign influenced troublemakers. Um, who picked up a foreign religion and destroyed order in China. Um, Zheng Guofan, the general who put them down, used to be seen as sort of a traitor to the Chinese people for having suppressed the, man, for having suppressed the Taiping. Um, now he's held up as a model of like loyalty to the government. You know, all the things that the Communist Party now wants people to be, you know, loyal to the government, embracing harmony, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's a massive shift. And I mean, when I was one of the things that I that I thought about a lot when I was working on the typing is that, you know, here is the biggest civil war in human history, and there's almost no commemoration of it at all in China. There is one museum for the Taiping in Nanjing, which was their capital. It's a small museum that's poorly funded. And a lot of their exhibits are just like recreating a garden of the home of one of the Taiping kings. It's, it's a non-controversial museum um, and very few other sites compared to, you know, I live in Massachusetts. And like every little tiny town in this part of New England, you know, you go and they have the town green with a Civil War cannon and the list of everyone who served. Um, and I got to say, so for China, a Civil War is an either or proposition. Like one side was right and the other side was wrong, just completely so. Either the Taipings were the heroes and you should never talk about anything else or the Qing were the heroes and we shouldn't talk about the Taiping at all, which is where we are today. So did you have any feedback when you were, or, or pushback, I guess, when you were in China trying to talk to people about this, trying to talk to academics or work in archives or do research? Was there any pressure put on you to say, well, if you're going to come and write about this, you should write about it this way? No, because I side, I mean, you know, there's a lot of, you know, there are, there are whole institutes of, ty of typing scholarship, but they all sort of, you know, they have to follow along whatever the sort of historical judgment of the CCP is at this point in time. And, 
I read many of those, I looked at many of those books and read the articles and, you know, sometimes they were useful informationally, but I didn't find them ter terribly enlightening in terms of understanding the bigger picture of this war. So I tried to come at it with fresh eyes and look at the primary sources myself from the, you know, the generals on, on either side. Um, and also to try to look at it. And this is, I mean, I think this is the book that I wrote was the first one to really take the typing in its global context mm -hmm. that, you know, as you said, it overlaps with the U S civil war in meaningful ways. Um, you know, especially vis-a-vis -vis the British who were buying their cotton in the U S South and then, you know, turning it into fabric and then selling that in China. And when China fell apart into civil war, they lost their market there. And then when the U.S. Civil War broke out on top of that, that was their two biggest markets. And, you know, there were debates about how can we restore our markets? And in the end, the British decided to intervene very fatefully in the Taiping Rebellion to try to restore the dynasty. Yeah, um, I think that's one of the things about your book that, that I'm, uh, is really impressive, among other things. I want to talk about working in the Chinese archive, which I just can't imagine how difficult that must be. But... Um, Placing it into, of course, an event that big can't happen without people outside China noticing it, states trying to figure out where their state interest is. As you said, the British directly intervene. There are some Americans who go over there. Um, you know, that, that's how did you think about that as a as a scholar? I mean, you 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 want to tell a Chinese story, but you don't want to only tell the Chinese story. How did you how did you think about that as you were in your sort of pre-writing phase? Um, I thought about it sort of panoramically, and a lot of the chapters shift perspective. Like there'll be a chapter from a, per a perspective from within China, and then one that's you know set in London or somewhere like that. Um, you know, same way that if you're putting together a movie or something like that, that you know you um, you can tell a story from multiple directions, and you know all of the chapters that are set in a certain place, even if they're scattered throughout the book. They are telling a certain side of the story sort of continuously, as long as sort of everything is stacked up in chronological order. And so you can get that sort of dizzying feeling of looking at this war from the outside as, you know, as American newspapers were trying to make sense of it. And then you go straight into the middle of it and what it felt like to be in the middle of one of these massive battles in the middle of the war in China. And so you can give the reader a more universalist understanding than anyone involved had at the time. Hmm. That the foreigners involved at the time didn't know what, what the Chinese were experiencing, really, and vice versa. And, and the, the Chinese did not destroy most of the archive. I mean, there are historical events. We could talk about, about several of them where it's just hard to find archives because governments destroy those papers. I mean, a lot of the French stuff, even from the liberation of Paris in World War II, did not survive, either because the government intentionally destroyed it or people destroyed it to cover up their own crimes. But there, there, there is paper on the Taiping in China. And how did you get access to it? Where is it? What's a, what's a, this... what's a Chinese archive look like? <laughs> um, I... <laughs> The great gift that I was able that made this book possible because I was writing this book right after our daughter, our first child was born. Um, there was no possibility that I was going to be going and spending years in an archive in Beijing hunting for fragments about the Taiping. The gift that made it all possible was that because the Taiping were seen as great, here, great sort of pre-communist heroes in the 1950s and 60s. Um, there were these eminent scholars in China who devoted their lives to collecting every possible source they could find about the Taiping and publishing them in these huge multi-volume compendiums, um, which they have at the Harvard Yanjing Library, they have at the Yale Library and places like that. These So massive publications of primary sources from the you know, that were compiled in the 50s and 60s. Um, and you didn't have was, to leave New England to get to them. That's amazing. And I could bring them home and work with them, you know, while my da baby daughter was in her little sling, I could be reading, you know, original documents from the rebellion. Um, and, you know, these were people who were like literally going village to village, house by house, trying to find sources. Like in a lifetime, I could not possibly accumulate what they had brought together in these collections. Um, so that's, that is what made the Chinese side really possible. And it was also, the same thing. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Go ahead, please. Sorry. And I was also going to say that there's a certain amount of finesse involved when you were writing about characters who have very lopsided amounts of sources available on them. Um, so just, I mean, so Zheng Guofan, the general that I mentioned on the, on the imperial side, because he was, 
an eminent scholar because he was on the side of the dynasty. All of his works survive. So for him, he was one of my main characters. I had you know 17 volumes of his collected works and all of the letters he wrote and his journals, daily diaries, everything. For my other major character who was on the Taiping side, because most of the Taiping materials were destroyed after the war ended, all I had for him was a few pages of confessions just before he was executed. And trying to sort of balance them in this story when I have so much information on one and so little on the other um, is it's it's one of the it's one of the real challenges of writing narrative history. Um, so, yeah, to keep that to keep that balance and to keep the reader from necessarily seeing um, that the historical record on these two individuals does not compare, even though their historical stature does. And was the same true? You also wrote about the Opium War, which I won't ask you to summarize because that might be be even more complex. But it happens about a generation before Taiping. Uh, is the same thing true, or did you were you? I mean, I assume there must be mountains of material on the British side because they were the other major combatant in this. Uh, but are there Chinese documents on on the Boxer Rebellion as well? I'm oh, sorry. I'm, the, I'm sorry. The Opium War. I'm sorry. Boxer Rebellion. We could also talk about, but we'll skip that. Absolutely. Um, Because the Opium War is another one of those seminal events in modern Chinese history as viewed in China. Um, In fact, like the Opium War, which is around 1840, and traditionally in in China, the Opium War is considered the beginning of modern Chinese history. So it's, you know, everybody knows, everybody knows the history of it. And for that too, there are these huge collections of archival sources that have been published because they are about the Opium War. Um, so I was able to use a huge amount of those while I was working on the book. So I had you know more primary sources than I could possibly read, um, and so I could go into very fine detail on individual on various individuals, read all of their memorials to the throne, etc. Um, and the British side, um, the, the British side wound up being a more creative approach to the research, I think, because there isn't any similar collection in Britain. So for that, it was much more of going to little libraries and little places that happened to have a batch of somebody's letters, um, tracked down the descendant of one of the major British actors at his little country home. He's like the, you know, the, the inheritor of the Lord Napier title. And he had all of his father's diaries from when he went to China, just sitting there in his house that nobody had ever looked at. Um, I think the same is not true. I, I mean, I, I think it's not really true, certainly not true now in China for a foreign researcher. Somebody who is Chinese may, may have much better luck in being able to scare up sources that survived the Cultural Revolution and the World War II, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but archives in China are increasingly restrictive. Um, and, it's, and right now, it's, you know, it's barely possible for foreign passport holders to use them in any meaningful way. Hmm. When was the last time you were in China? And and uh, I'm asking because I'm I'm curious about your take on ch- the Chinese government's ability to control history and the way that that is influencing the way Chinese people see both their own government and see the United States. Um, I was just there a, a little over a month ago. I, mean, I was there in the in the middle of July. Um, that was my first trip back since COVID. And I mean, as far as the telling of history there, it's, I mean, in my lifetime, it's never been so restrictive that um, Xi Jinping has made it very clear that the telling of history is central to the party's control. And that, I mean, he talks about historical nihilism, where effectively um, to believe in anything about China's history other than the, the, you know, the sanitized party version of it is in his eyes, nihilism. It's like to believe in nothing. Um, so there, there is no room for, for debating histories. I mean, it still goes on. There's a wonderful book that's going to be coming out in September um, by Ian Johnson. It's called Sparks. Um, he's, a, he's an excellent China journalist. Um, and it's about underground historians in China. Um, trying to write more truthful histories of things like the Great Leap Forward famine. Um, But they they work in a constant sense of danger. There's nothing new about that in China. My books are full of sort of upright scholars who are, you know, torn to pieces by the government in their own time or scapegoated for various things. So it's, I mean, it's never been a terribly safe thing to write history that doesn't agree with what the government says in China. But it just felt when I was when I was there in July, it just 
the degree of surveillance everywhere now, um, just the feeling of being tracked constantly, um, you know, people are just the same as ever. People are perfectly chatty and friendly and whatnot. But it feels like, whereas it used to feel like you could sort of do your research and nobody would really notice, or you could write your books and nobody would really notice. Now it just feels like the government is capable of observing everything. And how do you feel like that that control over history? What what does that do for the way that Chinese people see the United States? Does it? I mean, I would have to imagine if, if the Chinese government is giving them one version of history, it's not going to be one that is particularly complementary to the West or the United States. Is that is that playing a role? Do you think? I think it does play a role. I can't do you know I can't do surveys of the public to find out what people really believe about the United States now. But you know, anytime you're in sort of an echo chamber with one sort of with one version of events being repeated over and over that, I mean, it, I mean, this was true all the way back in the nineties, my students were being taught, you know, that, that, you know, America always seeks to contain China, to hold China down, that it's jealous of China's rise. And, you know, they were constantly being taught that in school, but there were always ways of hearing differing versions. Um, now, I mean, honestly, being when I was back in July, when I was in China, it felt much more like a Cold War situation. I hate that term being applied to U the U.S. and China right now, but the absence of tourists, um, I didn't see any foreign tourists, um, the absence of students. There used to be about you know, 14, 15,000 American students a year who would go and study in China. Now there's about 350. Um, businesses are pulling out the all the sort of the personal contact that might give your, your Chinese person on the street in Beijing, you know, differing views of the outside world from chatting with a foreigner in town. It just it, those foreigners are not around anymore. Yeah, we we had wonderful experiences both in both of our trips to China. Just talking to to average Chinese uh, people, just that we met on the street. We had an opportunity to go into an English language school in Changsha, and we had a we had a wonderful evening talking to students. And teachers there, and I, I am told by, by by friends like you that say that those possibilities are are harder and harder and harder to come by in the current government. Um, I, I have to ask you this because of where I work and, and who most of our listeners are. Is there anything you think that an insight of your study of Chinese history suggests for the way that this U.S.-China relationship is likely to go in the future? Is there anything from this study of the past that might I don't know, give us some clues, some insight. I mean, it seems to me that neither side of this equation really understands the other very well at all. And part of that comes from the fact that they've had very different histories and they're, they're societies that don't study each other's histories very much. Is there, is there any insight you've, you've gleaned? Oh, that's a really good question. That I took a very long time to ask you, so <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> no, let me think about that for a moment. Um, I mean, to be honest, I feel like in many ways we're off the map right now. Um, that I found, I find the current situation in U.S.-China relations disorienting. It probably, it, I mean, it probably resonates more with the Cold War era, um, post World War II. Um, I don't know how much my previous books speak to that. Um, Actually, while I was in China, the group that I was with, we had a meeting at, at Xinhua, the state news agency, um, and there was a, a reporter there who asked me about the Taiping book. And she said, well, if you were writing this today, would you write it differently? And I thought, well, actually, no, I wouldn't. Um, but I did. But the thing that that I think is important is for all that the U.S. and China have pulled apart from each other in recent years, especially since the pandemic, um, China is still very much integrated into the world and is very much a part of the world. And I think things have generally gone best when Americans had a strong curiosity about China and when they were able to distinguish between the government that is in Beijing and the huge mass of Chinese people, wherever they are, whether in China or in Taiwan or in, in California or in Singapore or wherever they happen to be. Um, I think the danger comes when through distance, like right now, people start thinking of China entirely in terms of its government. Like China has a scary government right now. That doesn't mean that the people of China are necessarily scary. Um, people of China were perfectly fine when I was talking to them. You know, th th um, this doesn't mean that like Chinese Americans are somehow a threat or anything like that. But that that I think is the biggest risk is conflating the government with the people of the country. Hopefully, this current regime will not last long. Um, but I think. Yeah, you know, if we're looking for 
historical relevance, we really do have to look in the 1950s and 60s to see something similar to this. Well, I wish we weren't running out of time, but we are. And there's always two questions I like to ask, maybe three questions if we can do them real quickly here. Um, the first would be, what lessons have you learned from writing that you give to your students when they come to you? What What do you tell writers that, that you've picked up from all of this work that you've done? Um, it has nothing to do with China, but that you write by ear. Um, that your your first draft, you get all the information down, you make the arguments that you want to do, and then you revise endlessly until it sounds good to your ear. And that, and it's you may go through twenty revisions in that way, but getting it to sound right to yourself is what's going to make it sound right to a reader, and which is going to make them want to keep reading. The other <laughs> lesson I have is that readers are really impatient. Um, I'm impatient. Um, readers have a million other things that they could be reading. And I tell my students, you know, your professor has to read your paper. But once you start publishing things, you know, nobody has to read what you're writing. So you have to be impatient as a writer that you have to be constantly imagining the reader and whether you've lost them or whether they are confused or whether they are getting bored or whether you're dragging things out tomorrow. So, yeah, it's a, it's about hearing your own prose and it's about trying to imagine yourself as the reader as you're writing. Our, our listeners can't see the big smile I have on my face, and that's because this is the exact same advice I just gave to a group of people last week, a group of students here oh, last really? week. So I'm glad to hear that reinforced. Uh, what are you working on now? What, what's your next project? I'm writing a World War II book right now, actually. Oh, fantastic. Uh, yeah, about um, it's about an American Marine officer named Evans Carlson, who embedded with the Chinese Communist Army in the late 1930s. And then came back after Pearl Harbor and tried to apply all the lessons of guerrilla war, of Chinese guerrilla warfare to the U.S. Marine Corps. Um, so he created a battalion. He's really sort of the father of special forces in the Marine Corps, um, one of one of a handful. Um, but he created this Marine Raider battalion, which he deliberately trained to fight like the Chinese communists and then took them off to glory in the Pacific. Um, you know, became one of the most decorated Marines of World War II household name. He's, he's the guy who, who, you know, he introduced gung ho to the English language. Hmm. Um, and then, you know, crashed and burned after the war in the McCarthy era because he was so sympathetic to the Chinese communists. So it's a biography of him. I've got, I'm, his, his granddaughter has let me use all of his family letters and I have his diaries from when he was in China. Um, and he's sort of this unusual figure who, his life really links America and China in World War II in a way that nobody else has really does. He was the leading American military observer in China prior to Pearl Harbor um, and then served as a combatant in the Pacific and was you know, considered a real authority in his time. Um, died in 1947 and then was completely forgotten, disowned. I think a lot of our listeners will be very anxious to to read that book. So uh, I'm looking forward to it, too. That sounds fantastic. Uh, last question. I always ask anybody, any writer, what are you reading right now? I'm reading. I, I, I read mostly fiction, honestly. Um, I'm reading a, a and I can never remember titles. I'm reading a new book by um, by Richard Ford, which I just started reading. I can't even, I can't even tell you what the title is <laughs> in the middle of it. Um, well, let's see. What have I read recently? I've been I've been reading an advanced copy of that book, Sparks, by Ian Johnson, which I highly recommend. Um, I've just started the new Dennis Lehane novel. Um, reading Richard Ford. I I I yeah. I love Richard Russo. I'm looking forward to reading Somebody's Fool, which just just came out. Um, I mean, my favorite writer is Stephen King. What can I say? Um, and Lee Child. I can read them endlessly. Um, and you know, when it, when it comes to history, I, I read tons of history for work, but mostly it feels like work because that's what I do. I think in the same way that, you know, somebody who works in classical music may listen to jazz for recreation or rock and roll or something like that. Well, Stephen, I'm really glad to hear this story and how uh, a leaflet put in your mailbox changed your life. And the fact that, uh, we have a connection to of all places, Hunan province in, in central China. Uh, I want to thank you again for joining us. Uh, I wish you nothing but success. I want you to get this book done so that we all can read it. Uh, and thanks once again for joining us. Thank you very much, Michael. Really and thanks it. to all of you for listening in. Please send us your comments on this episode and send us any suggestions for future episodes. You can subscribe to A Better Piece on your podcatcher of choice. And please rate this episode and review the podcast because that's how more people can hear about us so that we can continue to grow this community for conversations like this one. This conversation is over, but we look forward to welcoming you again.
Until next time, from the War Room, I'm Michael Nyberg. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. And have a great day.